Hello, and thank you for joining us. My name is Kat Quinn, and I'm delighted to moderate today's See Further program, Empowering Self-Care from a Young Age, brought to you in partnership from Novartis and the Boomer Esiason Foundation. We have an exciting program focused on a topic that's very near and dear to me, but first let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a mother of two beautiful girls, nine-year-old Maylee and seven-year-old Elsie. Maylee has cystic fibrosis. In honor of Maylee and her spirit for life, I founded the Blooming Rose Foundation, a nonprofit organization with the goal of assisting families that have received a diagnosis of cystic fibrosis. I'm also a social worker and a health communicator and very passionate about providing information and resources to the CF community. Joining me are Siri Baith Dunn and her 20-year-old daughter Tess, who has CF. Also with us is Dr. Susanna McCauley, a CF physician at Anne and Robert H. Laurie Children's Hospital of Chicago. Welcome to all of you and thank you for participating. Let's take a look at CF by the numbers. As you can see from these statistics taken from the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation's 2013 Patient Registry Report, the good news is that your children will likely grow up to be adults, so they need to be prepared to take care of themselves. The data show that the median predicted age of survival was 40.7 years. Those 18 or older make up 49.7% of the patient population. They will go on to college, start careers, marry, and even retire. As a parent, you can help your children reach these milestones by making sure they are empowered and confident self-treaters. Setting the foundation for your child's success starts with you. As our guests will discuss, there are many things that can create barriers to adherence. Barriers may arise from the healthcare system, the community, family, and the person with CF. Our goal is to provide tips that can help families working to find a balance between supporting their children and starting to hand over control as they manage their CF. I know firsthand how challenging it can be to create and keep routines, especially when life has other priorities. So I'm looking forward to hearing from our panelists and the tips they have based on their experiences. Now I'd like to introduce Tess and have her weigh in. Tess is a singer-songwriter in the Bay Area and in her third year of college, studying sound engineering. She has released three albums of original music and performs throughout the U.S. Tess is also a CF advocate and has contributed her talents to CF awareness. Tess, can you tell us some of your thoughts on how parents can help their children with their routines? Yes, thank you for the introduction. Absolutely. Uh, I'm just going to dive right into my first point, which is there is no definition of normal. Um, I've always found that term to be very strange because what is normal? I ask that question a lot during my shows when I speak to people um, because I'm very out about my cystic fibrosis. Um, but for me, doing respiratory therapy, taking pills, injections, that is like brushing my teeth. That's normal to me. Granted, there is a small group of people with cystic fibrosis uh, and there is a large group of people who get to roll out of bed 10 minutes before they have to leave in the morning <laughs> without their respiratory therapy. Um, but I think because of that, the word normal emerges from that society's way. And especially for teens and kids, that can be hard as they grow up because suddenly they're hoping to fit into these standards because there was, those are such key years in discovering who you are and where you stand. Um, for me, I was diagnosed early, so it felt stranger to not do my treatments, and I think a lot of uh, teens and kids feel the same way about that. Um, but that's one of my main, my main tips. Don't let normal dictate your life, because your health is most important. Um, going along with that, my second tip is live life but stay adherent. I find that to be very important. Um, I've grown up with the number 37 above my head. When I was diagnosed, the uh, median age of survival was 29, and now it's at 40.7. But with 37 above my head for 18, 19 years, it has definitely pushed me to succeed and accomplish everything that most people have a lot longer to accomplish. Okay. Um, so for example, I wanted to go to college. That, is, that was a huge goal of mine since I was 13. I graduated from high school a year early. And I, I pushed through a lot, and I understand that college for others is an opportunity. It's a choice. Uh, it's a rite of passage. For me, it's an accomplishment. Um, but in doing so, I learned the hard way that you 
cannot compromise your health in order to live your life. So that's another tip. Don't compromise your health because you're excited to live your life. My third point is learn to adapt, which is uh, a bit strange sounding without any context. Um, I was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis related diabetes at 11 while I was in the hospital after sinus surgery. Um, so I inject insulin both 24 hour and before I eat anything high in carbs. So that was in sixth grade. I was in my final year at a school I'd been at for seven years, so everybody knew me. It wasn't a big deal at all. But I started at a new school, middle school. We all remember what that was like. <laughs> um, and I didn't think anything of it at that point because going back to my first point, normal. That was normal for me. Um, so I was at a table eating lunch with 10 kids. This was within the first few weeks. So we're all trying to make friends and figure out who we fit with and finding who we sit with at lunch. Um, and I pulled out my syringes to start injecting and a kid goes, ew, why are you doing that here? Go do that somewhere else. Mm. And that was so embarrassing because it's a table of 10 people and the kids who are having conversations are suddenly looking over at me going, what is she doing? Um, and again, you want to fit in. You want right. to fit in at that age, especially. So I was sort of shamed into the bathroom from there on out. And that was hard. Um, eventually, though, he came up to me and said, I'm sorry for saying that. I'm just scared of needles. Good that clarity. Doesn't even, exactly. <laughs> I was like, all right. Well, that wasn't the best way to express right. that. But that makes sense. I've never had that fear. I've had blood draws. I've had IVs. Right. Needles, don't think about them. Right. But here for another kid who doesn't do that regularly, needles are a scary thing. So in learning to adapt, I learned to adapt to your surroundings. There are going to be people there who don't feel comfortable with needles or perhaps taking pills in this public setting um, might not be appropriate for whatever reason. Right. Um, so in that way, I've learned to adapt. I don't feel shame doing it anymore. Right. I respect people, but not out of shame. As I've grown older, it's not like that. It's out of respect. Um, but at the same time, at the same time, um, you know, I'm, I'm also using it as an educational moment to say, this is what's going on. This right. is why I'm doing this here. And um, actually, the learning to adapt, I, a friend of mine was feeling down. I could tell, so I was going, hey, is there is there something going on? Because I'm here to talk. And he looked at me and went, actually, I was just diagnosed with diabetes at 19 years old. So he's gone 19 it's years not even brain. thinking about this. And I jumped on and went, OK, well, you're going to go see your endocrinologist. You know, mention, mention using this. Uh, right. Ask questions about this. You're injecting this many times. Well, maybe you know you should talk to, talk to him or her about that. Um, oh, this is a great brand of uh, needles if you need them. <laughs> You're a resource. <laughs> exactly, and it was so exciting. You could tell he was relieved because he didn't have anyone else to talk to. Right. And in telling him all of this and giving him examples of what I do, at the same time, sort of held me accountable to do what I needed to stay Absolutely. healthy. Um, so learning to adapt uh, has been to both respect people and know when to jump in and help people. And in that way, it's definitely held me accountable and uh, forced me to learn to stay adherent to the max because other people are going to go through the same thing and maybe want to hear from me. So That's admirable. My fourth and final point is to surround yourself with people who build you up. That has been very important for me. It's also been a learning experience, definitely. Um, going back to wanting to fit in, right. you, you want to have friends. You want to have people surrounding you. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes like when you're younger, when I was younger, I didn't know any better that there were toxic people who who weren't going to support me through that. And I made the mistake of keeping these people in my life. And then the second I got sick, or I asked if they could not participate in certain activities when I was around, such as you know smoking, whatever, right. because I can't be around that, it would be the eye roll. It would be the, oh, sorry. It would be the, the unreleased tone of, really, really, I have to do this with you. Um, and ultimately, it was like, good luck, I hope that goes well, and the ghosting. And I didn't, I didn't understand 
why that was for so long, and I would call my mother up crying, and even now I sometimes call you up panicking as I'm getting home from school, um, because those people will surround you your entire life. But I would call her, and she would constantly say, don't let these people make you feel small, because that's not who you are. Um, and it was never, well, that's life sucking up, kid. It was always, yeah, that's unfortunately how life is, but remember there are a lot of people who love you, surround you, want to be there for you. Mm -hmm. That's what matters most, and that's what you have to draw your strength from. And now that I'm older, again, growing up, hindsight is 20-20, right. um, I just surround myself with people as strong as I am and with people who truly do care. They care about me and they understand that I'm not my cystic fibrosis. Right. And I'm not, and if there are people in my life who only see that, um, I don't need those people in my life. So that has been something that I've learned a lot and I'm glad I have. I'm glad I've been able to learn that right. um, because I would not be who I am today without the people that currently surround me. Tess, I'm so glad you were able to make it here today. It was wonderful to hear your story, and it's so inspiring to listen to everything you've overcome from childhood into your adult years. And I think that when other parents and children can listen to your story, that they'll gain a lot from your perspective. So thank you for coming. Siri, who became involved in CF advocacy 20 years ago when Tess was diagnosed as a five-month-old. In addition to being a social worker, Siri served on the board of Cystic Fibrosis Research Incorporated, CFRI, for more than a decade before joining its staff. She supports CFRI's efforts to fund research for a cure and to provide education and support services to those impacted by the disease. She served on the Parent Advisory Committee of the Cystic Fibrosis Center at the Lucille Packard Children's Hospital, where she helped to keep CF at the forefront of the hospital's family-centered care program. Siri, thank you for all your efforts and congratulations on all your accomplishments as a CF advocate. Tell us how you have helped Tess stay adherent. What routines have you and Tess created so that she feels supported and able to take ownership of her care? Thank you, Kat. That's a great question. And I would say my primary philosophy as a parent in general, but specifically as a parent of a child with CF, has been to encourage Tess to think big and never be limited by her CF. And in living that philosophy, I, I have six tips. I would say as a parent, one of my main, what I feel is a gift to Tess has always been to role model advocacy for her health care. And that is from the individual level and up to a broader community level. So at the individual level, really starting from the beginning in clinic would be showing advocacy with her care team um, and working with them in partnership, asking questions, um, and really getting whatever information I needed. And obviously I wanted it because I was a parent, but I also wanted her to see that she could feel completely comfortable asking them for clarification, asking questions, and being her own advocate um, for her health. At a broader level, um, I immediately sought out CF-related organizations and so uh, and became an advocate at a broader level, community level, and tested as well. So she participated in fundraising events, she did educational things at her school, um, and I thought this was really helpful for Tess because she realized it, she wasn't alone in this. And it wasn't, it was on two levels. She was not alone in this because she knew there were other people with CF. She was part of a broader thing. She also saw the broader net of support that surrounded her um, in her community. Um, and then the other thing I always emphasize with Tess is that CF is a part of who you are. It doesn't define you. Tess is a daughter, a sister, a student, a musician. She's funny, she's witty, she's smart, she's a great dancer, and she has CF, but it does not define Tess. It's just a part of who she is. It's wonderful. My second point, and this is very personal for each parent, um, but for, for me, the key was to share, share your CF. And I think that was very helpful for Tess in that there was never any level of embarrassment or secrecy about it. And when you share your story and share your CF, it helps to build your community and build your support system. Uh, right away, I was able to rely on friends and family, find people that I could teach how to do Tess's treatments to um, so that we could get that kind of support. 
So in sharing the CF, I was able to then rely on friends and family who could provide support, um, emotional support, but also physical support in the sense of doing testis treatments um, and that I could feel safe leaving her in other people's care. Um, another thing that was important to me was to link to other CF-related organizations. And soon after Tess was diagnosed, I saw a flyer for a conference that CFRI was holding and went to it. And the information was incredible and very, very useful. But what was almost more important at that point for me was that I came into a community of people who were living with CF. And I met other parents whose kids had just been diagnosed. Um, who I felt were really walking the same path as I was, but also as, as helpful or more was meeting parents whose children were further down the path at all stages, adolescents, young adults, and I could see them as mentors and, and a support system for me. My third tip for parents would be to establish routines and establish them early. Um, for Tess, she was diagnosed at five months, and so she never knew life without CF. And so we put her routine into place when she was a baby. And so for her, I would say it would be, um, you know, there are things you do every day, and treatments are part of that day, and it's not a negotiable thing. It just is. Um, I also recognize sometimes a routine can become so ingrained that you do things almost on autopilot and don't realize, what, you can't even remember if you took that pill or didn't take that pill because it's so you know, such sec second nature. Um, and so we actually went, developed what we called the pilot's checklist because you know everybody knows the story when our pilot's about to take off, they go through this very lengthy checklist. Well, we did that, uh, Tess and I together made a list of every single piece of her treatment uh, routine in the morning and in the afternoon and the evening and would post it you know, as a grid, and as she did each step, she would check it off, and that would help get her back on track. And it wasn't something she'd have to do every day. Once the routine was, it was clear, she was hitting all the marks, we could move away from having the pilot's checklist, but it was very helpful. Um, my fourth tip would be to always problem solve together. Um, be a team with your child. And I always felt Tess and I have been a very good team together um, in terms of her routine. And you know, we're all human. And uh, I always, people who don't live with CF, I think the hardest thing to understand is that there is never a break. You have to do your treatment. And so it's, I, I recognize the, the burden Right. that Tess carries, even though we can say it's routine, it's natural, it's part of her norm, she's never known you know, life without it, it is still a huge load of responsibility to carry. So Tess is very good about maintaining her routine, but we are all human, we all forget the keys sometimes, things, things happen. And so for Tess, with this long list of things she has to do every once in a while, things may be forgotten. She might arrive somewhere and not have the enzymes that she needs. My philosophy has always been about positive reinforcement and also just recognition that it, it could be the keys versus the enzymes. And so for me as a parent, I always looked at what is a pattern and what are the outliers? Now if it's a pattern that she's regularly not taking her enzymes, then you need to address that in a certain way. If it's an outlier, she simply forgot that day, then it's, that's a different situation. Either one, though, uh, entails communicating and really looking what happened, how do we get off track, how do we get back on track so that that doesn't happen again. Also, I think it's important to acknowledge as much as you want to lift your children up and be positive and give them hope, that you have to acknowledge it's not fair. I've always felt for Tess that I want to give her little gifts of love. It's my way of showing my support for her, these little acts of love. And it's something that people who don't have CF and families that don't live with CF wouldn't even think about. But um, kids with CF have to do so much. Their regimens are so detailed. And we as parents want to know that they can claim it, understand it, right. and you know, care for themselves. But that doesn't mean that at any age, we as parents can't give them these little acts of love, which could be sterilizing the nebulizers or making sure that they're you know, adequate meds or making that run to the pharmacy. Um, that these 
little acts of love can help, I think, sustain and help them carry that burden. Um, I encourage parents to uh, really pay attention to the different developmental stages because our expectations as adults may remain constant, but our children are evolving constantly right. as they go through the developmental stages. And in particular, uh, it gets especially challenging during the teen years. And parents have to really recognize that all the issues that teens face in today's society, uh, but you know, drinking, partying, sexual activity, smoking, all those things, they're happening for your child with CF. And I think for a lot of parents with CF, it's easy, you become so wrapped up about the CF, sense. you almost forget that they're navigating life just as an average teenager. Right. And yet the implications of those activities can be more severe for a child with CF. And so that the key is to really pay attention to your child all the time. Check in with them, open communication, and also acknowledge that as a teenager, quite often that is when issues of anxiety and depression can emerge. My fifth point is the fun, the fun stuff. And I think it's really important. It's been great for Tess. I have always felt like she has so many things she cannot control around her health. And so the areas where she can have control and have choices, that she gets to own them. And the more fun, the better. And so for Tess, at a very young age, she was in love with hair dye. And so through the years, she's had flaming red hair, blue hair, purple hair, bleach blonde hair. <laughs> And to me, that was a choice she had control over. And you know, my sisters with young children were very upset with me because they felt like the pressure was on them, their daughters wanted to dye their hair. And I said, you know what, Tess doesn't have control over her CF. She doesn't have control when she has to go into the hospital. It's just hair. <laughs> you can right. cut it, dye it, color it, doesn't matter. So that's just one example that was important for Tess, but for parents, I would encourage them, have the talk with your child. What's fun? What are the choices? Mm -hmm. And try and carve those areas out. And then my final point, and circling back to the, the thinking big, is to support your child's passions. And Tess, Tess is a very passionate person. She's hardwired that way. Um, and I felt my role as her mother is to support her in those big picture passions. Well, for Tess, she's a musician, and so it was supporting her, and she's recorded her albums and performed, and you know, I've been a roadie and the merch queen and the <laughs> PR person through the years, but it's been key because that is a whole piece of Tess. CF is a part of her. She's all these other things, and in supporting her and her passions, it's letting her really um, break free from the disease and be who she really is. Absolutely. So a couple things that I've found to be helpful for our family are to um, really just fight as a family. Like you, when the diagnosis comes, it feels very individual. It's very patient-based. But the truth is, is that it affects all of us. And um, really coming to a place where um, we actually are fighting with her is the goal. One aspect to the treatment time that I think is the most critical is just being present and being a part of it and not having it be something where she's off in another room doing it by herself. For one, I'm not able to make sure that she clears her airways the way that I know she needs to. And two, I, I want her to know that I'm fighting this with her. And so for me, um, and having two girls, and one that has CF and one that doesn't, I wanna include her the other one so that she doesn't feel isolated from the family during CF treatment time. I feel like that, you know, that has potential to cause resentment and um, frustrations on her part being the younger child. Um, and so we read together every morning um, for an hour. We get under the blankets and we cuddle up and I have my coffee and we read chapter books and, um, and then in the evening we either play a game or we read more stories, but it's a time that the world stops and it, no, no cell phones ring, no nothing. It's just like this is our time that we really focus on our commitment to keeping Maylie healthy and and to keeping mental health and mental wellness in the family of this is just something our family does together. So our family just as a whole is very focused on being healthy and exercising and eating good foods and making choices for our bodies that are what we believe to be you know, the best choices, but, but Maylee kind of takes that to another level with her treatment and with having to adhere to this 
two hours to three hours a day of respiratory therapy, like we want to commit something to her as well. And so we got this poster that has every day of the year on it. It's just the dates and, um, and it says no days off in huge letters and it's the size of our refrigerator. And every day we have to cross off, my husband and I, we each cross off one and, um, and she'll hold us accountable. If it's nine o'clock and she's going to bed and mine's not crossed off yet, she'll be like, have you done your exercise yet? Um, which I think is really good for her. It's good for her to keep me in line. It's good for her to see some days I'm like, oh, I just don't, I don't want to do it. Like, I don't want to exercise today and have her talk me through it. And she will. She'll be like, mom, you can do this. Like, you, you know? So I think that um, just really modeling the self-care that we're expecting from them or you. <laughs> like that's a really critical part and it's hard. So it's something that I have to push myself to do every day. Um, and then eating well. I mean, we, we definitely kind of take things to a little bit of extremes in our house, but um, you know, not having sugar in the house is really hard for me, but I know that it's a benefit to her. And so, you know, we do that. So as we know, CF is scary. I feel like in Maylee's case, she's very, she seeks out information. She wants to understand, like, you know, it's not enough for her to know that she takes enzymes for this, for, you know, digestion. She wants to understand why she needs them. She needs to understand the body really well. Um, and so for her, knowledge is power. But that can also bring a lot of questions and a lot of difficult questions at times when she asks about things that, um, that I'm not always prepared to answer or I don't wanna know that she's already thinking about it nine. Um, and so, you know, a lot of the time, um, I need to take time to really process the question and the best way to answer it so that there's a, a very good basis in reality, but that it's not evoking more fear than what she can handle at her age. Um, and so, you know, when she comes to me with a question about disease progression, for instance, which happens often, um, you know, I just often say something to the effect of, like, I want to give you a really good answer and I want to have a discussion about this, but I don't know how to answer it perfectly at this moment. And so I'm going to think about it and I'm going to get back to you if that's okay. And she's always like, yep, sure, that's great. And then we are able to kind of sit down my husband and I and really like talk about like does this how much information does she get right now like what is she emotionally prepared for how does she handle hearing this like be able to react very neutrally and then come at it with an educated response that helps them move forward with a sense of determination and empowerment to really fight. I know that for Maylee um, as we talked about earlier being in control and being empowered by her um, you know, self-care is really important to her. And so I've found that with her, it's very critical to get her involved in, um, you know, just the early conversations with her care team and um, not only for her at this point, but I think long-term to be able to be comfortable at 10 or 11 or 12 with the care team. Then when she's 18, 19, and 20, I don't have to be as worried because that's already just such a part of who she is and being able to communicate how she feels. Um, and it's very, it's a difficult task for us parents. We, we get really attached to the care teams. We feel like we know what's best for our children because for the first four or five years, we were their voice. And taking that step back and realizing that at a certain point, like we are no longer the expert for them, that we're actually kind of just the support staff and allowing them to be able to um, articulate how they're feeling to really get the best care that they can. And I wonder, I mean, if she did have like pain in her lower left lobe, I wouldn't know that. I would have no idea, you know? And so getting her to the point where she can really say, oh, right here doesn't feel great right now and then we can move forward in really rapid treatment versus waiting until there's a cough and all these different things that you know kind of the normal parent progression of how to treat um, and so I think that um, really getting a good um, groundwork of empowering the child to be the expert in their in their health management is critical. Cystic fibrosis there's so there's so much control that 
is taken away from our kids at an early age. One aspect that we allow Melee to control is kind of the, um, I guess, the manip manipulative parts of treatment. So, you know, we say we're going to start sometime between 4 and 4.30. What time do you want to start? And she will pick the time. She sets her little watch, and, she's, and then she'll come to me when she's ready. Um, and then, you know, what, what type of treatment, what type of airway clearance do you want to do? You have four options. What do you want to do today? Um, or, you know, do you want to read books or do you want to play a game? And, um, and I think that while those are really small, they at least give her options. And my fifth and final point, which I think is a really critical one, is help and being okay to ask for it um, within your support system, whatever, if that's made up of, like, we all need help, especially um, parents as we're coming into this and navigating through um, all these different stages. And so I think, you know, it's really critical to find key people that you can trust in the CF community that have been there before you, um, that you can go to to just kind of deal with these emotional um, issues of, of the gravity of CF. Um, I have a handful of CF moms that, like you, that have been there before and gone through a lot of different things and have um, a perspective that I respect. And, and that allows me to realize that everything's going to be okay. Like, you get to all these different stages and it's still going to be okay. Um, and so, and also just, you know, my, my home community and they, they're just amazing and so supportive of the CF side of our life, but also embrace me as just Kat. I'm just Kat, I'm not Kat the CF mom. I, and I think that's so good for all of us to just kind of let that, have a place where we can really let that go because it can be so all consuming. Even, I mean, we worry about our kids and not wanting CF to be their identity, but we also have that burden of, of allowing it to become too much of our lives too. Um, and so I really think that it's really valuable to focus on having good people that you can go to, but then also having communities where it's not a part of who you are. Now I'd like to ask Dr. McCauley for her insights. She has nearly 30 years of experience. In addition to her clinical practice, she conducts research on new CF therapies and on improving CF care. Dr. McCauley, can you tell us about strategies that you've seen that work in your practice and haven't worked? So thanks, Kat. I am so delighted to be here today. And the first thing that I want to say is that you guys are really the experts in this whole issue of how the family works to help create independence and knowledge and power in children with CF. And Tess has now um, successfully navigated her way into adulthood with CF. So what I really have to add is the perspective of a practitioner who's seen many, many families over many years and to try to um, sort of put these themes together for people to think about because every family is unique and every family needs to find their own way. But there are tools and ideas that I think everyone can use. And the theme um, in this is really let the child lead. Um, and so part of that is preparation. Obviously, um, if you have a baby diagnosed with CF, Tess was a baby when she was diagnosed, most people these days are diagnosed through newborn screening, um, the baby is not going to, um, for example, get their own nebulizers ready. But what you can do um, is first develop a healthy attitude and keep a healthy attitude. So you want to, of course, acknowledge the feelings that you have when your child is diagnosed with CF. Um, often it was not expected. Um, it's scary. And there is a loss there because when we become parents, we always expect a healthy child and we're thinking about all kinds of things for the future and we're not really thinking about all of the different variations with that. So it's it's hard and it's important to grieve and it's important to acknowledge your feelings. It's important to give yourself time and to recognize that people grieve differently. It's also important to know that once you are settled into the CF rhythm, there are setbacks that can take you back to that grieving process. So it may be something like a 
bad culture result, something that needs to be treated. It can be something like the diagnosis of diabetes that Tess told us about. So think about it, be prepared. We're all human, we all have emotions. It's okay to be sad. But what you want to project onto your child is that this is something that's just something that we need to do. Um, you want to be aware of the language that you use around cystic fibrosis. Yeah, we're fighting it, but it's actually part of who your child is or who you are. And so there's that balance of fighting the battle against the disease, but accepting that it's part of your life. Even the body language, the facial expressions that you use, the way you talk, even in infancy about like, if you're saying, oh, I wish you didn't have to have this chest physical therapy, if that's the message that's going around, that becomes a bad thing. And that not only can set up for poor adherence in the future, but it can actually make the child feel bad about themselves or bad about their CF. And it's really like a lot of other things in life. Anything that you need to do, you need to go to the dentist, you need to be in your car seat, or by the time your test is age, wear your seat belt when you're driving. They're not the most fun things. They're part of what you need to do, and they're part of keeping healthy. In terms of introducing your child to their CF and their, their needs, follow their lead. Take it a step at a time. We talked a bit about, you know, when kids ask questions, but look for elements of readiness. Um, even small children can do small chores. You know, if we think about family life, it might be something like clearing your own dishes from the dinner table, even by the time you're three or four. So little things that a child can do to really participate, and it sounds like you guys have really done that beautifully over time. As they get older and you're giving them responsibilities to do independently, remember that it's a process. You want to check in with them. You want to supervise them. You want to remind them. Thinking of, think of it as teaching. Um, it's something that doesn't go from you're doing it all to them doing it all in one smooth, you know, step. Um, it's one thing at a time. And uh, partner with your care team on some of this readiness. Um, the multidisciplinary team, the nurse, the dietitian, the social worker, the respiratory therapist, they've all been through this with many families, as has your physician, your nurse. We can really talk about, you know, what the readiness is for them to start taking on some responsibilities and at the same time they're learning about CF and how to take care of themselves. The third point I'd like to make is it's really important to be patient with the process. Um, many parents are new to child development just as they're new to cystic fibrosis. So, um, you know, Babies you take care of, toddlers you try to teach, you know, safety and <laughs> try to help them um, sit still for their therapies as you've done with your books at home. Um, but uh, you need to understand that as they get older and can do more things independently, that's a big step from being entirely responsible for care. And development is not a smooth continuum where every day you know more and can do more than the day before. It goes up and down. Um, there's something called executive functioning that really has to do with how the brain keeps people organized. And we know that executive functioning isn't fully developed until adulthood. So all of these multi-step, many things that we need to do every day for CF care take a long time to master. You want to understand that um, there are many other things going on with them that might influence their mastery of that step. And that gets into being flexible and problem solving together, as Siri talked about earlier. Um, so giving the example of uh, preparing and caring for nebulizers that came up before. So that may be a kid's responsibility, but they may then have um, 
a school play and they're rehearsing after school for hours and they still have their homework or it's final exam time in high school and they're taking AP exams and they got to study a lot. So you say, okay, this is your job, <laughs> but I'm going to do it for you because I'm going to help you. That's the <laughs> loving support that we talked about. <coughs> And that gets to the next point, which is really to set reasonable expectations. Uh, you want to avoid any shaming and blaming around um, both forgetting to take a medication, forgetting to do a treatment, not maybe sterilizing those nebulizers before bedtime. It's more a conversation, you know. So what happened? What do you think we should do if that happens again? Um, I'm a big believer in the rewards um, and not so much the punishments. What you're really trying to do is build good habits. I have very healthy teenagers in my practice and I ask them, you're doing so well, your regimen is kind of complicated, is, is this hard, is this causing stress or pressure for you? And they look at me like I have two heads, like what are you talking about? Because that's just what they do. And so you want to make CF care just part of what you do. And then if a new element comes in, like a new medication or diabetes, there's an adjustment, but you have good patterns and you have good habits and you have confidence and your kids have confidence that, yeah, it's another thing and I don't like it and it's not fair, but right. you know how you can adopt another habit. And then um, another thing that we've touched on today that I think is so important is to develop and rely on your support systems. So again, with um, CF generally being diagnosed when children are very young, your biggest supporter is often going to be your partner. You want to have open communication. Um, you want to grieve together and, and respect individual differences in that process. But you also want to keep in mind that that's a special relationship and you need to carve out time for that. It's very common when parents have kids that they sort of forget why they're parenting together in the first place, <coughs> um, why they chose each other. So you need to nurture that relationship. When I meet um, a family of a baby who's just been diagnosed with CF, I tell them, to schedule a date tonight in a few months so that they can get out of the home together. That helps highlight the importance of the partner relationship, but it also creates a need to bring more people into the support system. Um, the people who love you want to help you. Um, your family, your close friends, um, and you may be feeling scared and overwhelmed by CF and you don't want to share that feeling with them necessarily, but they want to help you. Developing friendships for both parents and for kids um, brings up the issue of disclosure. Um, how do you tell people about the CF that affects you or affects your family? Um, how do you <coughs> negotiate that? And um, I think we've also touched on this with Tess's story. So it's not one of these things where you go in and say, you know, hi, I'm Tess, I have CF, when you first meet a new friend, right? <coughs> you're, you're going um, along your life and then people may ask you questions. So a common thing it's in school is that a kid will ask a kid, like, why do you have to take pills before you eat? It's good for those kids to be prepared. I need pills to digest my food properly. The vast majority of kids who ask that question will say, oh, okay. <laughs> if they ask more, then they're probably really caring and curious. Um, and you need to decide if you want to talk about that now or say, you know, I prefer not to talk about it right now, but let's catch up about that later. But I'm also a big believer in just being open with it, not hiding it. I encourage people to tell their family and close friends quickly because as I said earlier, people do want to help. Um, and there is a great CF community with a lot of resources. And by joining it and being open about it, you can get so much back and, and really feel like 
you know, you're not going through that alone and that you've got so many other people that you can rely on. And that gets to um, information therapy. I'm a strong believer in knowing where to get good information and using it the way that works for you. So this is different than just being educated about your disease or getting the basics about your disease that you may get from your health care provider. It's about knowing where to go when you want to find reliable information, knowing what websites are good. Um, I often refer people to the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation website. There are many others. Um, we give people a handout on safe web surfing. So you also can, as a consumer, figure out what sites have good information and what might be sort of hearsay, anecdotal. Um, I, I think look at anything you want, but think in your own mind whether you should be skeptical of it or whether it seems reliable. But think about that. Talk about that as a family. Um, there's a good chance that not everybody in the family feels the same way. And then talk about how you're going to get your information and negotiate that. So I think all of these things are just about building habits, um, feeling like you have the power to affect your own outcomes and your kids' outcomes. Thank you. That was wonderful and gave us insight into, you know, your perspective as a practitioner, which I think is really valuable because we're often on, you know, on the other side of the wall, for mm -hmm. lack of a better term. So it's, it's great to hear that you see that a lot of the same ways that we do. Yeah. Yeah, well, you guys have been very inspirational. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Of course, the tips that each of us provided today are based on our personal or professional experiences. And not everything that works for us would necessarily apply to others. So it's important to know your family's dynamics and adjust your actions as needed. I strongly believe that personalizing your approach will only make things better. Let me tackle that from the point of learning new treatments. So when I work with Maylee, when, she's, when there's another device that's brought in or a new antibiotic, we really kind of go through it um, together. We'll sit down and kind of make an event of it and really look at it and talk about it, talk about the modality, like what it does in her body, how it helps her or what it affects so that she really understands like when she's using PEP that it is expanding these lower lobes that it's helping to increase like movement and you know things that she can buy into as a nine-year-old so that she understands the purpose of why she's doing it um, and that seems to really help her um, or help the resistance there isn't as much of that pushback from her because she knows why we're integrating something new. Another support for Maylee in learning new treatments is her sister. She loves to hear about the new things that are coming up for her, the exciting breakthroughs, and I know that that sibling support is so critical to her. Has that been your experience as well? Yes, yes. I have a younger brother, Dylan. Okay. He's 16 years old, so he's in high school right now going through the cool kid phase. <laughs> <laughs> he's always been cooler than me, so I'm used to it. Um, but he is... We are very different people, I mean, starting from the fact that I'm fairly shy. Completely different, but he is one of the happiest, funniest, just most positive people I know. He's a complete ray of sunshine for everyone in our family. Um, and it's, it's great having him around. Um, I would not blame him for ever feeling any resentment towards me. I know that I take up a lot of my parents' time that's going to the hospital with me, it's staying there for days or weeks. Um, so, like I said, he would have every reason to be upset about that, but he's been nothing but kind and helpful and accommodating and understanding. Um, of course, it wasn't always like that. For example, he'd have to do a chore and I would be doing my treatment and therefore be on, online or whatever and he'd go well that's not fair that I have to go do this while she gets to be on Facebook um, but after we explained to him yes but doing her respiratory therapy sort of is a chore because it's not a choice she has to do this it, it clicked instantly and I that was years ago I haven't heard him say anything since mm -hmm. um, and I know for my parents they they spend so much time because of me and my health um, with me but they also do a great job of, with the balancing act of giving him attention as well. So, for example, there have been times where we've gone to a doctor's appointment, 
driven back the hour, and then they've jumped in the car to get off to a baseball game of his so that they can be there for his game. Awesome. So, um, but seriously, he's been so great and so understanding, and I'm very lucky to have a brother like that. Such an asset to your, to keeping you on track to have that support, I'm yes. sure I know it is for me. Definitely. So I know that you mentioned that you were in the hospital and that I'm sure that affected your school. And as it does all of our lives, I mean, it's, you know, every time everything kind of shifts, what does it look like for you with all of your patients and the school system and, and integrating CF into that? And Yeah, um, it's a great question. But one of the things that I really emphasize is preparing the school well. So there's some very good information out there um, to give schools about CF. They need to know basics like um, a cough does not mean that the kid is, has an active infection that they need to be excused from school from. At the time when kids start uh, kindergarten, I strongly recommend that they have a formal 504 plan. A 504 plan is a federally mandated plan that requires schools to make accommodations for kids who have special health needs or developmental needs. And so the basics that everyone with CF should have in their plan is to have uh, liberal bathroom privileges because, believe me, the teachers will try to not let the kids go to the bathroom in the middle of class and if you've had a digestive issue that day, that may not work sure. for you. Um, most kids with CF need to take enzymes before they eat. Those need to be, there needs to be a plan to get those delivered safely and reliably at school. And then I always emphasize things that families may not have thought of. So you have a child going to kindergarten maybe who's never really had a serious respiratory infection, um, but you want to have in that plan um, home tutoring in the case of a prolonged illness where a child needs to be in the hospital or at home on IV antibiotics so that they don't have that added pressure of missing a lot of school um, and not being able to catch up. Other families, for example, have two sets of books so their kids don't have to carry a 30-pound backpack back and forth particularly if they're smaller for their age or if they, um, you know, you don't want them to necessarily burn a lot of calories <laughs> if they're yeah. walking with a 30-pound backpack. But it's all about proactive planning so that if something happens, you know, and, and I've had many patients who have gone from diagnosis to high school graduation and never been in the hospital. And I would like that for everyone, but let's just take an extra <coughs> measure to make sure that if that happens, you don't end up um, having a secondary problem right. with um, getting far behind in school. And it's particularly important as kids get older, the older you get, the more likely it is that you may need a hospital stay. The older you get, the less forgiving school is when you miss days. So gotcha. I think just planning, thinking about it, and being open with the school and making sure that um, there's very good communication between the office, the school nurse, the teachers, so that everything goes smoothly and there's no big deal made of cystic fibrosis at school. It's, take care to, it's taken care of, but you're there to learn. You're not there right. to have CF interfere with the other things that you want to do. Right, uh, sort of mm -hmm. plan ahead and really get it executed before. I think that's really good advice. Speaking of hospitalization, Siri, do you have any tips on how you and Tess have meandered through those waters yes. over the last 20 well, years? <laughs> as Dr. McCauley said, she'll have patients that'll go through childhood and adolescence and never be in the hospital, and obviously that is the goal for everyone, but um, it's a capricious disease, and you can do everything right yep. and still have an exacerbation, and certainly Tess has been in the hospital multiple times, and um, <coughs> I think for us, a key thing when she's going in is to prepare her to, through the years, to let her choose her favorite things that she could bring to have with her, whether it's pictures or, you know, some of it which was young, the stuffed animal or the comforter, um, to personalize it for her. Um, I know, Kat, you've shared with me a great story about your daughter, Maylee, that when she's going into the hospital, the community rallies in your support system and you have a pre-admit party 
um, which I just think is so wonderful because it can be such a frightening experience and to have right. everybody rally and make it something fun yeah. and, and loving is, is wonderful. Um, but when people ask me, what can I do for you? The thing I always stress, and this comes back to the sibling uh, issue, is check in with my son yeah. because it is horrible what Tess is having to go through, um, but it's also very hard on the sibling. And, and when Tess has been in the hospital, I stay there and we don't live close to our hospital. Right. And so I am gone. Um, and it's been very hard, I think, on Dylan through the years. And so I always say, if you want to help me, you'll help take care of my son. Bring him a gift. Take him out for his favorite food. Make sure he's included you know, in plans. And uh, so I think that's a key thing with hospital stays to expand it beyond just the person, the person with CF, but to really look, especially at the siblings. That's a really, really good point. I need to take that one home with me. <laughs> So as we talk about school and hospitalizations and kind of the more difficult things um, in our lives with CF, I thought it would be a good time to also talk about vacation. It's a great thing to plan and get, you know, excited about as a family. And so I think that, um, that a lot of people that are living with CF kind of push that off because it's so big to deal with getting everything organized to the point where you feel like you could actually take a vacation. Um, but as we know, it's a critical aspect of our lives to have this, this place of just being who we are without the CF. And one thing that our family does um, is just being very, um, very organized in medications. Always, I always plan one extra week. Who knows what might happen? The other aspect for us is being able to, um, to be free from um, you know, having to be somewhere to do treatment. So Maylee is very good at using PEP therapy, which we can do in the car, which enables us to be able to go on long trips and to feel like she's doing a good job at clearing her airways. And so we can get up from a campsite early in the morning, jump in the car, she does treatment while we drive through the Badlands or whatever, and we can, um, you know, then get out, go for the hike and do what we were going to, what we would have normally just done, right? But but it allows us the flexibility to not have to worry about a power cord. And so that was something that was really important to us, that we don't lose those moments because it's not as convenient as it could be. And so, um, you know, that in coupled with, you know, being prepared with medications and knowing where CF <coughs> centers are along the way if you need them and um, just, you know, really having a plan and then allowing the trip to happen. And I, that absolutely would be the most important thing, I would say, is pre-planning, because yeah. it can be so stressful. Um, but if you think in advance what you need, and as you said about the CF centers and the pharmacies, but also, you know, I always travel with a power strip, because you can arrive in a hotel room that has one very inconveniently so placed true. outlet <laughs> behind the bed, and there's only one. Yeah. So I just, I always pack a power strip, um, checking to make sure there is a fridge, because so many of the medications right. have to stay cold, um, timing things. And it is completely possible to go and be relaxed. But for me, you know, I have to have my checklist. If you have Absolutely. the list and you check it off before you walk out the door, um, yeah. you can arrive and you feel ready. And it's, you know, you may make ad adaptations during the actual vacation about treatment time and the plans, but you can go have this wonderful time if you just take some simple steps in advance to prepare. You know, it's really, um, it's one of these things where being really, really organized allows you to be really spontaneous. Another thing um, that uh, you can ask for are disposable nebulizers. So you may be in transit not right. able to clean and sterilize appropriately. So these are things where the healthcare team has, you know, seen lots of different ways to solve problems. One thing that I learned fairly recently, actually, um, after years of bringing my respiratory therapy and being pulled aside by, you know, the TSA agents and going over all of it um, and digging through my luggage, you're not allowed to touch when they need to find what's setting it off. So right. I learned to place your, for example, what sets it off now for me is my nebulizer. Place my nebulizer on top of everything and that they would they can just locate it without having to dig through. One final thing on the airplane issue, the TSA agents, one told me recently that because they're wearing those blue gloves, 
but they never right. take them off, which in other words means their hands are just filthy. Right. And so that you are perfectly within your rights to say, my child has a health condition, could you please put on clean gloves before you touch her respiratory therapy equipment? Right. Yeah. And that you should not feel embarrassed about doing that. Um, one other <coughs> quick tip, whenever we travel, we actually walk up to the, the, at the gate and say, my daughter has a health condition, or could we pre-board? And they let us do that so we can make sure we can store all her stuff. Oh, but great. also, the key thing is that before everybody is there, we literally wipe down all those surfaces that are touched by five million people. Um, yeah. So that we we create our little sterile zone before um, <laughs> before we get on, and they, I have to say the flight attendants love it. They're like, yeah. "You're the clean zone. We want to stay here." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's just one of those things, and you should not. I would encourage other parents don't feel embarrassed about it because right. again, CF is one of those disabilities, one of those illnesses that is not necessarily visible to everybody else, and you just have to not worry what they're thinking right. and just do what is the best thing for your that's child so point. you can get to your vacation spot yeah. and remain healthy. I just want to remind you that these tips are available on the BEF website. So now that we've provided our tips and suggestions, we would like to answer some questions that we receive from the CF community. Question number one is, I've caught my 13-year-old occasionally being dishonest about whether he's done all of his meds. How can I get through to him? The importance of each med and how and why they help him, as well as the consequence of not being compliant. Siri, can you weigh in on that? Well. First, I would say that is probably a universal experience for every parent of a child with CF. So first I would reassure that person and this is not meaning that your son is bad or you know something between them. This is very, very common. And he's 13, which is a very challenging age, as we talked about before. There are many peer pressures. There is a desire to fit in with the peer group. And you know, it could be that he's feeling embarrassed taking his enzymes in front of his friends. There could be many variables. So uh, my key thing would be to first communicate, ask questions, and really listen. And try and tease out where, where is it falling apart for him? Why is he not doing that? What is the situation at which he makes that decision not to take them? Um, in terms of getting through to him the importance of each medication, I think that boy's physician has told him many, many times, the nurse, the parent, um, I think this would be an opportunity to say, listen, I need to hear from you. I think I feel like I tell you these things. We all tell you. I want to hear from you about what each do. one does. And so to help <coughs> you make the connection, because quite often when you verbalize it yourself, you're processing in a different way, and maybe that will help him make those connections. Um, in terms of consequences, every parent has their own parenting style. Uh, I always, my style has always been to reward and acknowledge and celebrate the great behavior um, and steer in that direction. That having punitive consequences for not taking the medication ultimately is not going to be helpful. It's what strategies can we have that you will be recognized right. when you are adherent to that treatment. Thanks. Let's move on to question number two, which is what do you think is a good age to begin the steps toward independence? I'd like to start with my own experience here. That's something that I'm very passionate about with Maylee, and um, and I started very young with her. I'm, you know, at the point that she could put Legos together, I felt she could put her nebulizer together. It wasn't. I mean, there were plenty of times when, you know, I mean, she has trouble with certain ones getting them to fit, and so I'll double check them. But I feel like um, that's a simple way for her to be involved or to grab the medication out of the cupboard. So at four. Um, she would get things out and it was at that point it's kind of fun for her and it's something that she can be proud of that she's a part of um, and then as you kind of you know as she's gotten older I've you know you take it up a, a level and this is the first year she's started putting like reconstituting medication which is a big deal for her but she feels very empowered by the fact that she can do that. So it's like we're a team and we just we each have our own jobs that allow us to kind of, um, you know, take on just a portion of the big picture of CF. But they, all these little steps lead to her being independent with CF. And I, that's my goal is that by the time she hits 15, 16, 17, that she is confident in, in being able to care for herself. Um, and that starts at four when you can put Legos together and play with things and follow simple di directions to be able to go to the white box to get two salines out. So I guess essentially I just feel like 
as soon as your child can um, follow through with a simple command, that there should be some amount of involvement on their part. Our next question, do you think parents' compliance with medications and treatments from a young age largely affects that child's compliance in their teenage and adult years? Dr. McCauley, you seem like a good fit for this question. What are your thoughts? Well, I have a lot of thoughts, as you might imagine. <laughs> but um, I do think, as I was saying before, that getting CF into a routine, just something that you have to do every day, right. um, is incredibly important to model that behavior as kids are becoming more independent. And think about developing habits and routines so it's second nature. And you want to think about putting CF as a priority, and it's really because you don't want CF to take over your lives. It's a little bit ironic, but that whole right. idea of you need to be on top of your treatment, you need to listen to your body, um, and let your parents or later your doctor know when there's a change. That's something that's very, very important to role model. And it gets back to the healthy attitude. Um, if you hate it and it's painful and you skip it more often, then your child will absorb that like a sponge and they will feel the same way and it will be hard for them to be a healthy teenager and adult. So yeah, absolutely. It's not, it's not just a transfer of attitude, it's really a building of habits and confidence. Thank you, Dr. McCauley, it was wonderful. Um, so let's keep going with question number four. At what age do you start telling your children about CF and when to tell them about the bad aspects of CF. So Tess, do you remember when you started to learn about CF? To be honest, I was so young that I don't remember exactly when it was, okay, this is CF, this is, this is what you have to do. Um, mainly because it wasn't telling me what I had to do, it was simply doing it. Right. It was doing the CPT, it was doing the variety of respiratory therapy and medications that I had to take. That all just came and as I grew to consciousness of what was going on myself, it was already in place. All these practices were already there. Um, I do remember when I was six or seven, um, I had just started taking piano lessons and I, the first song I learned was My Heart Will Go On by Celine Dion from oh, Titanic. So cute. Because I had, uh, I had seen the scene and I loved the song and I was like, okay, first song I have to learn, obviously. Um, and I was very, very curious as a little kid. I still am, but it, it started the second I was born. So I went online and I Googled Celine Dion to learn more about her, come to find uh, that she was a huge supporter of CF research because her niece had actually passed away from CF at a fairly young age. Um, and that, at that age, I still hadn't fully grasped that concept. That was I knew I had CF, exactly. Right. I knew I had CF, I knew I had to take care of it. Didn't quite realize progressive meant extremely progressive. Right. Um, so I ran downstairs, I think, to the kitchen where you were washing dishes or something, very casually. But that was definitely a huge turning point and we had a conversation. Well, obviously, that was a much younger age than I ever thought we'd have that right. conversation. Um, so it, I was quite shocked <laughs> with I'm no sure. preparation for that moment. But I think um, truly from that point on, I mean really from the moment of diagnosis of your child, as a parent you're, you're walking that fine line, you're um, walking that tightrope between um, sadness and worry and the need to have hope because right. I don't think parents, you know, we're not even addressing the people who have CF, but for the parents, um, it would be hard not to be depressed all the time right. if you did not have hope that things could be yep. okay. Right. Um, so for, for my response to her then, obviously age appropriate, but um, was to maintain, yeah, yes, acknowledge it's a serious d disease and some people do, do lose um, their battle to the disease earlier on. And, um, but you have to go with the positive. There's so I do think for parents, it is good to think through what message you want to convey. Um, but I would strongly advocate that you, I would strongly advocate people think through that in advance so that in right. the end, they are giving hope to their children. That's great information. Let's move on to our final question. I have a 12-year-old son with CF. 
I'd appreciate tips on getting him to take his medicine without prompting. Dr. McCauley, what are your suggestions here? Well, the easy way to explain this is um, that's not a realistic expectation. A 12-year-old does not have the executive functioning to remember and be responsible for what is usually a complex medication regimen. 12 is not a time when you can expect independence and particularly uh, complete independence. The flip side is um, that it is an age, you know, that pre-adolescent, early adolescent age where discussing how you move from parental dependence to independence is very important. Help with that skill building. If there are parents who didn't start when their um, kids were preschool age <laughs> in assisting with parts of therapy, give them the responsibilities. One of the things that I think can be a good um, way to do that is have them responsible for planning for their enzymes that they're going to take when they're not at home. So maybe over the weekend. Okay. It's a great, great perspective. Thank you. Well, this has been enlightening, but I'm sorry to say we are out of time. It has been my sincere pleasure to be here today with Tess, Siri, and Dr. McCauley. I would like to thank you all for participating and of course thank our sponsors, the BEF and Novartis for providing this forum. I've always been so proud to be an active member of the CF community and it has been an absolute privilege to be able to take part of the CF Further webcast. Thank you all for tuning into this webcast as well. Don't forget to visit the BEF website for additional tip sheets and information. Thank you.